My name is Anne Roisman. I'm the founder of Test Masters Academy. And today is our next webinar in the series of building our power in the age of artificial intelligence. Today, the webinar is on data bias and cybersecurity in artificial intelligence. Our panelists today are Aprajita Masur. She's a senior manager of bioinformatics software test at Guardian Health. Chris Kostakis, who is a Chief Information Security Officer at Pink Lion, and Nishan Chelva Chandran, the founder and CEO of Iron Lakes, and Davar Ardalan, she is the founder of iWow AI Incorporated. Um, please welcome everyone, and I would like every um, panelist to talk a little bit of your background and um, tell us what's your expertise in this subject matter. Hi everyone, this is Aprajita, I also go by AP. Um, I am a mother inventor and speaker, I'm very excited to be on this panel, and I lead the bioinformatics software test at Garden to Help. Uh, my company is working in the space of precision oncology, and we work with advanced stage patient can uh, cancer patients uh, for their diagnosis. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Kostakis. Um, I've been in um, the, the information security area for, for the past 20 years. Um, I've got a 15-year career at IBM, and uh, primarily um, the, the application of information security to a business. I'm currently serving as the Chief Information Security Officer um, for Pink Lion AI. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nishan Chava Chandran. Uh, as it says there, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Iron Lakes, which is a cyber consultancy based here in Finland. Uh, a bit about my background, um, I'm a former police officer from the UK uh, uh, with deep kind of cyber crime and intelligence kind of background, let's say. Um, and then that kind of led me on to some more academia and research and led me on to what I'm doing now at um, Iron Lakes. Uh, we focus on AI, biotech, uh, blockchain, cybersecurity, and IoT, and uh, various mechanisms to connect uh, businesses and academia together to actually have tangible solutions uh, utilizing these technologies. So that's, that's, that's about me. Hi, everyone. I'm Devar Ardalan, uh, also mother like AP, uh, tech entrepreneur and founder of iVow AI. My background is I was a journalist at NPR News for over 20 years where I was responsible for growing our audience beyond the radio into the digital space and bringing in uh, new listeners from different backgrounds. And as I looked at the future of artificial intelligence and automated storytelling in particular, I saw that many of the challenges that we grapple with in public broadcasting around lack of diversity and reach uh, overall is gonna be worse in the age of automation. Uh, brands are looking for hyper-personalized ways to reach Customers, uh, governments are looking for ways to design smart cities, and yet so much of the data sets are not culturally relevant to a global audience or even to local ones. And so I'm excited to be part of this webinar. I'm also excited to have all of us be from around the world. So Anna is in Egypt today, Nishan is in Finland, uh, Chris is in Minnesota, AP is in the Bay Area, I'm in Maryland, and uh, excited, thank to Anna really for um, putting these webinar series together with AP so that we can talk about how we can build our power in AI. So today's agenda is we'll be going through a very brief introduction to what's AI. Then Chris and Nishan will be touching upon cybersecurity elements that are important for AI. Uh, we'll also discuss why diversity is important in AI with Davar and then we'll open up for Q&A. So we've been hearing the term artificial intelligence for a while. And if I really wanted to think about what is the best AI out there in the world, it's actually the human brain. So each one of us has it, pretty awesome. Um, and what is AI? Um, there's, so, there's so many definitions out there. I picked up the one from Wikipedia. Uh, so in computer science, artificial intelligence, sometimes called machine intelligence, is intelligence demonstrated by machine in contrast to the natural intelligence displayed by humans. And then there are many AI systems and there's a lot of debate around how to categorize them. However, most experts 
align on three broad categories for AI. And so the first one is artificial narrow intelligence. The second one is artificial general intelligence. And the third one is artificial super intelligence. So the first one is basically focused on one narrow, simple task, and it processes a simple, uh, you know, uh, task. The second one, which is AGI, is same as human. And the third one is super intelligent, which is uh, better than humans. And we would think, where are we really today? We're talking about AI. It's been happening for so many years. And there's so many systems out there uh, that have AI. So some simple examples are uh, cars, Google search, which all of us use every day, like email spam filters, and something as simple as your phone. Well, it's not that simple, but your phone is full of AI. Um, so is, are we really close to like the super AI, right? If you think about Terminator. Actually, we're not. So all of the examples that I talked about fell, fall into the very first category, which is artificial narrow intelligence. And that's really where we are today. We haven't even raised the surface of general intelligence or super intelligence. And so how do we describe artificial intelligence like today? And for a computer, something as you know, calculating a square root calculation is very simple, but that's not very simple for humans. And so we might say, oh, computers are really smart. Um, if you think about it through evolution, as humans have spent a lot of time doing other things, you know, not so much math, but things like being able to grab an apple. And if you really consciously think about all the activities that happen in our body when we try to grab an apple, uh, you know, you would think you have to grab an apple, you have to picture, you have to identify an apple, you have to extend your arm, all of your muscles, all of your body has to function in order to grab that apple. And that is very difficult task for a robotics person to implement. So this might look difficult to us. It's simple for machines. Uh, another example is animals. If you want to identify images, this is a very common uh, thing right now in AI to be able to identify. This book is actually from my son. He's a, he's a three and a half year old. And so if you were to ask him to identify any toddler to identify different animals, they can do it. For you to implement code to be able to identify animals, that's actually pretty challenging. This specific example might be easy because these elements, animals are all different. So you can easily distinguish between an elephant and a fish or a macaw, right? But what about something like this? My son can distinguish between these birds. I can distinguish between these birds. But for a AI system to distinguish between these birds, it is not that simple. So what does that really mean? All of this means that AI today is implementing systems which are very easy for humans to do, but difficult for machines to do, like in very simple terms. So, so for example, something as simple as being able to identify different animals. And so how, does, how do we do it? So if you're trying to implement what is easy for humans and machines, how do humans do it? So this concept of artificial intelligence is not new. It started long, long ago. And if I was to simply define the very basic architecture of how our brain does it or how our cells do it in our brain, you know, uh, these are just a complex network of neurons which pass signal from one brain cell to the other. And we abstracted that out into a neural network. And today you can define that as a neural network is something, uh, you know, it's very simple to be, to take a given input and produce a good output. Um, and the, good, the important word here is good, not perfect. So how do we design all these networks? What does a neural network really mean? So there are three main type of neural networks or three type of applications or learnings. The first one is supervised or, classif or classification. Uh, simply something as simple as show and tell, right? So like we said, can you see something and say what it is? So face recognition, differentiating between dogs and cats. Unsupervised learning, uh, where we don't know at all and we have to, we are looking for patterns. So something like, uh, you know, theft, when you get an email from your bank saying, hey, did you make this purchase? So they're really looking for something which is different or something which is not common, right? Uh, or the other way around. And then 
The last one is reinforced or regression, which is based on observations. And this is something like correlation between past and present. So if you own a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or any of the variables, uh, they do this quite often, right? Where they can tell you, oh, this is your common heart rate. Now you, you're, you know, you're walking, so it's elevated, things like that. So what is machine learning? Um, again, it's a subset of artificial intelligence and people use these interchangeably. Um, this, is just a, this is just a definition in Wikipedia, but machine learning is really a small section of artificial intelligence. And so what exactly is a neural network that I talked about and how does it really work? So imagine that you have a simple input of an image, in this case, letter, the number one, and you, your neurons, uh, which are also called, in, you can Google this, like perceptons, the very basic type of uh, neural network that you can build. So imagine that each of these single cells are trying to identify what this one is. So you go, you have different numbers, they're looking from anything between zero to nine. When they look at this one, they try and detect and say, okay, I think this is 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.4, so on and so forth. They're still trying to identify what this input is. And at the end of the day, you have to figure out um, how close you were to identifying your input. So remember, I said good output, not perfect output. So in this case, the second perceptron um, took a one, said it's a 0.8, which is the closest thing to a one. And you're basically in your algorithm trying to figure out what is the loss here. So in this case, you have a loss of 0 0.2 and you're trying to minimize this overall. But how do you minimize? If you went from an input to an output, how do you really go and minimize this? So this gets into back propagation and this is a very common method in AI implementation. So what you do is you have a bunch of layers. There are multiple layers which are which take the input, they are processing what we just saw. And once they identify what the loss is or what you didn't, what is the delta between your perfect output and like the good output, um, you're, you feed that back into your previous layer and you keep doing that until you get the best possible outcome. There are a lot of type of neural networks, um, not just the one that I spoke about, this is a common, like I actually found this blog. It's very interesting. It has a lot of these drawn out. You can go look through these. Um, and there's also a very cool website called playground.tensorflow. Uh, and it allows you to build these neural networks and then play with them. And it lets you um, do a bunch of stuff. So for example, in the screenshot, you can see on the rightmost corner, there's this uh, drop down where you say problem type and the, the three type that I talked about. So one of them is classification. So in this case, this application is trying to build a neural network, which only has two nodes, right? The first layer has two nodes. The second layer also has two nodes or two neurons. And it's trying to uh, cla uh, use classification method on its output. So you can go and play with this. Um, I'll hand off to Chris and Nishan for cybersecurity elements and importance for AI. Uh, thanks, AP. Um, <clears throat> with, uh, I guess, with my view and what I wanted to talk about, really, especially after the very detailed and interesting uh, technical side of AI, I wanted to keep it more on a higher level. And I know that Chris being the uh, the CISO will undoubtedly be talking about some very interesting kind of data privacy stuff. So I don't want to kind of uh, have too much overlap. So my view is very much to have uh, more of a helicopter view, a holistic view as to cybersecurity and also where that ties into AI and vice versa. And, and also just kind of explaining more of the, yeah, the wider reaches of cybersecurity. So uh, on the uh, first slide that I have, which is after my nice news, um, there we go. So, uh, so yeah, of course, uh, traditionally speaking, uh, cybersecurity, when people hear it, they think of the technical, uh, what I always call like the matrix stuff or Mr. Robot, the, the hacking, the very, very deep tech um, uh, uh, exploitation of, uh, of electronic uh, devices uh, and mechanisms. And the traditional uh, definition, of course, of cybersecurity is that, is that it's the protection mechanism for um, 
the uh, these mechanisms and to uh, prevent unauthorized access or criminal activity uh, relating to those things. But um, I'll, I want to say more recently, but I think generally speaking, cybersecurity for me and in the wider context is actually incorporates a lot of other um, areas and, and, and domains and, and disciplines really. Um, and cybersecurity is very much the intersection of all things technological in that, in that sense. When you start actually looking at um, whether it's involving AI or, or in, in cyber itself, but actually focusing on things like a psycho a psychology, uh, sociology, when you start thinking of um, uh, social engineering and, the, and that kind of a, a attack vector. And then of course the legal and governance frameworks actually, actually kind of govern uh, how to protect certain things or um, what, um, what frameworks are, are, are there to govern responses and that kind of thing. So, so it's, it's, it's very, very holistic, um, thing that's that's uh, i think it's probably the, the thing i always say is that it, it's very much the one subject that you can do that actually covers all sorts of things and it's a very very broad broad thing um but i can go on about that for hours on this thing and i've only got 10 minutes so i'll, I'll move on to the, the, the next slide so really what i wanted to look at is again where does cybersecurity fit into ai but also what how is ai affecting cybersecurity again again when, when we start speaking of this synergic holistic kind of view so as AP mentioned that AI um, in itself um, is very, very broad in the sense that it consumes huge amounts of data, but at the same time, its scope is very narrow. And that there, there's this disconnect between a view of AI being this uh, singular uh, kind of entity in a way that it, it is self-aware when actually it, it's very much a, a directed mathematical process. Uh, but of course, um, that in itself makes it very good at um, pro, uh, essentially advanced data processing and, and, and taking huge data sets and actually what I call putting them through a, the sausage machine or the funnel to actually come out with a particular set of predictions that can, you can then utilize on other things. But it still, it still needs that human to put that output into context. So in, in a cybersecurity sense, when we start thinking of AI and this advanced uh, data analytics and these processes, um, of course, the next thing is uh, quantum computing. Because one thing uh, that is uh, that has always been the limitation of uh, crypto, or not crypto, but uh, crypto cryptography and uh, securing uh, algorithms and things is very much the fact that um, computing power limits um, how, how easily you can break certain encryption methods. And that's something that you can take years and years to, you know, to, to kind of break that. Whereas with quantum computing and just the sense of the revolution of computing and computing power, um, that very much will turn that on its head. And so current encryption methods will be broken in a matter of minutes, if not uh, sooner. So that in itself is a worry. And that kind of links into the, the privacy connotations because then you start thinking about, well, how do you secure my data? How do you, how do, you do certain things? Um, so in terms of AI, we start, when we start looking at how AI is used within cybersecurity, there's very much this approach again to move from, move away from a, a reactive uh, approach to just waiting until something happens and then analyzing to see what's happened and how do we fix it, to how do we actually do something in real time or close to real time? How do we actually analyze certain things, certain events, um, and actually try and work out what's, what's going on? And again, for a human to do that, that's, quite a difficult task when you think of a big enterprise company that might have hundreds of thousands of security incidents in one week or one day. Um, and then of course, trying to identify and differentiate between the false positives and whatnot. So using AI in that sense has been very interesting to actually be able to augment um, the actual uh, human capability. And that's something that I've always been pushing is that AI isn't uh, anytime soon going to be replacing humans. It is very much an augmentative, or augmentative technology. So if we move on to uh, the next slide, so I've, I mentioned here profiling, that goes on to the next one. So with profiling, when we start looking at data and we start looking at identifying incidents and events and, and the wider construct, this very much goes into something called cyber threat intelligence, where we're actually looking at um, what, you know, these incidents, what's causing these certain incidents, who's doing what, where, when, and why. Um, within cybersecurity itself, there's these different methodologies that I'm sure people here on the webinar are, are familiar with. Um, if not, I can explain them quickly. So you have the, the black hat very much is the, uh, the hacker who has bad uh, intentions, like the kind of the evil hacker. And then the white hat is the opposite person who wants to do things for the good protection. Uh, red hats are the offensive 
hackers and uh, blue hats are the defensive people that you might find in, in business. And of course, there's this terminology now, blue, uh, purple teaming, where, again, it's looking at taking all of these ways of thought and actually putting them together. And that's the best way to actually uh, have this very, very good uh, and holistic sense of, of security um, uh, and uh, Re, um, progressive uh, security. So when it goes into detection of malware and ransomware and, and viruses, of course, using AI in that concept is, is very interesting because of the very nature of malware now being quite heuristic and um, in, in its nature changes and, and changes its form and how it actually attacks and, and what it exploits. So having something that in turn that's adversarial that can actually uh, determine these anomalies and spot these things. But again, not necessarily automatically generating a response, but something that can spot it, that can then flag up to the human, to the CISO, to the teams, the SOCs, that can actually say, oh, there's something going on here. Let's, let's have a look at that. Again, it, it's taking that huge spectrum of data and actually putting that through a funnel that can actually be used. Um, the danger of that, of course, um, skipping through incident response and steam systems going on to... Uh, natural uh, language processing, where you start taking those mechanisms and you go into the privacy realm and you start going into behavioral analysis and how this can be used when you think of social media and uh, and just the wider world, wild, wild, wider world in general. We start using these mechanisms and actually you can start analyzing how people are doing certain things, why you know they're saying certain things and actually linking those things together. It can be very dangerous if I put my scary dystopian hat on and start thinking about social profiling and being able to identify if, if certain people are saying certain things that might put them in a particular box which then can lead to some awful things or of course you start again it, you, you start opening up the world to these very dangerous area of what we can start talking about uh, concepts of social scoring and that actually if people fit into a certain profile that therefore they might commit a crime or actually they might be beneficial to the society as defined by the particular political power at the time. So this goes on off into a very, very different tangent, a very, very um, scary, or what I think of a scary place, but it's, it's something that's interesting and that really kind of folds into the conversation. So if we go on to the next slide, um, this again, so I always think of this as, a, as the cyber world as very much a reflection of our, of our physical world in that um, all of the issues and all of the things that we see, especially start flagging up now, um, especially with bias in AI and how certain decisions are made and not made, it is very much a reflection of how we do things now and that um, the biases that we have and the views that we have are being reflected in quite naturally in uh, the, the digital realm. But the, the difficulty is that are, do we actually want to create just a clone of humanity or society as we see now or do you actually want to make something better? And for me, I want to make something better. So it's very much a matter of identifying how are we, where are we going wrong, or what are the problems that are being faced, and how do we actually uh, fix that? So again, I kind of brushed upon all of these different things about facial recognition. A lot of these things are in the news, and I don't really need to go into it about the, the dangers of it uh, and whatnot, especially when we talk about uh, criminality and social scoring. But bias in particular is quite interesting. And I don't want to go into there's all sorts of different forms of biases. And I won't go too deeply into the various forms. One thing I thought a good example that I came across uh, that I thought would be quite interesting, which is on the next slide, is with um, uh, what, going on to unconscious bias. And that's very much the matter of everyone has an unco unconscious bias. And a good, a good example I always use is with myself. If I go into a shop and I'm dressed in casual clothes, unfortunately, I'm treated in a certain way. Whereas if I go in wearing a suit, people see a suit and think, oh, this guy has some money or is somehow high on the social ranking. Therefore, I'm going to treat him in a certain way. I'm not suggesting that the person that's treating me in that way is actively discriminating from one to the other. But there is this unconscious perception that because of a certain, you know, based on, on cultural experience or whatever, because of what I'm wearing, it therefore you know, leads to a certain type of reaction. So that was, we found that um, if, uh, AP, if you go on to the next slide, um, a good example uh, I found was with Google Translate. And of course, we all know Google Translate isn't perfect and it comes up with some really fantastical translations. But a really interesting thing I found, especially in Finland, I don't speak any Finnish, so I use Google Translate a lot. So Finnish as a language is gender neutral in that it doesn't have um, a male or a, a female verb, or as you do in like French and some other languages where there are certain male, certain nouns or things that are masculine and feminine. So the actual translation to the on the left, which I'll, I'll give you, was very much that I was talking about Santa Marin, the 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 new 
uh, female Finnish prime minister. And so what I actually sort of typed in with the help of, of my partner was just to say that uh, after, after the working day, Sana Marin picked up her kids from school uh, and drove home. She ironed and cleaned, and then she took the kids on a moped ride and played tennis. And then at the end of the day, uh, she watched Formula One on TV. So with the, the language that, and the neutrality, when people read that sentence in context, oh, when people read that, uh, when people read that uh, sentence in context, they understand the he and the she and based on who you're talking about. But Google, funnily enough, when it, it took um, the terminology, so when it took ironed and cleaned and it's changed it to stroked and cleaned there, but it, re it related cleaning to something that a woman does based on its data. Women do the cleaning, therefore it allocated she. But then, of course, when you talk about something that's supposedly masculine, riding a moped, playing tennis, or watching the Formula One, it used he. And that, for me, is, is, a, is a very, very good example of unconscious bias. I don't think Google intended to, to have some kind of a, 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 a um, sexist flaw with it within the algorithm, but it just goes to show that because of the limited data, training data from uh, the Finnish data sets that they have, it, based on its best knowledge and what it could best, you know, best compute, that, that's what it came up with. So that really demonstrates for me um, the importance of um, uh, really diverse data sets and the fact that in order to have algorithms and AI that outputs uh, better and reflective uh, outputs, we need to have really good data and diverse data going in. Um, so we'll go on to um, my last one, but I'll actually just speed up because I'm over time now. Um, so yeah, that basically just covers what I've just said, that ultimately we need we need to really diversify our data sets, diversify the training, and really incorporate a lot of different angles into this, like we do in cybersecurity. But that needs to go into AI as well. And that the best way to actually output what we want to see and actually be the better versions of ourselves within the digital domain, that very much needs to be something that we input. And that's a work in progress. And I hope that we can continue that conversation. But I'll hand over to Chris now. So thank you. Thanks, Nishan. So, yep, again, Chris Kostakis, Chief Information Security Officer, uh, Pink Lion. I've got um, some digital forensics background, and I've, like I said, been in this industry for the past 20 years. Um, go ahead and move on to the next slide, please, AP. Um, Pink Lion, I won't spend much time on the company piece of this, but I did want to give you an oversight of, of what we do. We, we say that we bring artificial intelligence to the world's app teams. Go ahead. And by that, um, we focus on uh, artificial intelligence first approach to software, uh, web testing, and mobile application testing. Um, Pink Line specifically, we do visualization and dashboard reporting of data that's gathered by our bots that are performing the application testing. And we generally um, become part of uh, the continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline that's in use by these um, software organizations today. Um, you can see, you know, some of the things that our application provides sentiment analysis about how uh, folks in general are feeling about your app store application. Um, visual verification um, is what's being displayed on the page, um, what you were expecting to be on the page. Um, dashboards and our solution is both on and off premise. So that kind of gives you some oversight um, into the security issues that we, we deal with on a daily basis at Pink Lion. Next slide, please. And again, just um, some more functionality and features that our, that our application performs. One of the interesting things about it, um, the tie back into artificial intelligence, we do not look at any code layer for our application uh, to perform testing. Everything is based on computer vision. Um, that really is how we, how we implement artificial intelligence. Next slide. So when Devar asked me to put together a presentation on um, AI and security, I took a step back and, and hopefully um, you find this content useful. But what I wanted to do was take a look at how AI has impacted um, the security landscape, the modern security landscape in, um, you know, technology-based businesses, and really anybody who, who utilizes uh, technology to do their job these days. Um, and then maybe discuss a little bit about um, some scenarios that we've seen personally at Pink Lion and what we're doing to combat those. So hopefully you'll find that um, relevant and interesting from the perspective of being able to um, utilize best practices in, in security when you're online. Um, so to get into this a little bit, you know, we've... Um, talk a little bit about the impact that AI has had on security. And there's a lot of good. Um, two big things that come to mind uh, for me as a 
security officer, intrusion detection and event and threat correlation. Um, there'd be no way to effectively keep up with um, you know, these across an enterprise without utilizing artificial intelligence to um, give us a holistic view of what's going on across the organization. Threats um, are higher in number than ever before. The complexity and polymorphism of these threats, the different types of threats that are the same thing, but just modified a little bit on the surface to look different to systems that are automated and, and looking for these threats. Um, any intrusion detection system in enterprise these days um, is based on an artificial engine, in, and I'm sorry, an artificial intelligence engine that can look at uh, the events that are going on across the organization and put together a, a holistic view of the security posture of the organization. Um, the other thing that artificial intelligence has had a huge impact on is uh, MFA or multi-factor authentication. Um, AI has drastically increased the effectiveness of multi-factor. They look at things um, like what time of day are you logging into systems? Um, what's your behavior inside of those systems? What location are you logging in from? And um, I'm sure you guys probably use some of these and we'll talk about them later, but these systems really put together a profile of how you utilize information systems. And if there's anything that appears to be out of the norm, um, they decide that a password may not be good enough for you to get access to those systems and they'll challenge you for a different type of authentication on it. Um, AI is at the heart of a lot of those systems when configured properly so that you're not overly burdened by having to utilize multi-factor authentication, but it's there in the event to challenge you in case something's going on in those systems that um, looks like it's different from how you typically interact with those systems. Now, the bad side of, of AI and security. Really everything that's a good can also be flipped around to a bad because it's, you know, not only white hats have access to this technology and systems, but black hats as well. Um, so you see a lot of things. Bad actors are, are able to rapidly cover a lot of ground in researching and exploiting vulnerabilities. Um, I think Nishan touched a little bit uh, on that earlier. Um, and then, you know, the utilization, again, a lot of AI engines are, are open source. This you know, knowledge is, is commonly available out there. You see um, a lot of folks utilizing AI to develop AI-proof algorithms in malware and exploits that can get by the engines that we've got in practice today. So um, go ahead, uh, on to the next slide, please. So a lot of threats today have become more social-based really than technical. And I wanted to offer up practical security tips um, that you can employ while operating online. The first of which, be aware of the information that you make available on the internet and what it tells others about relationships that you've got, um, you know, professional and personal relationships. Um, I'll give you an example of that. One that we saw at Pink Lion recently um, is utilizing LinkedIn to actually create and chart organizational structure um, in corporate entities. How that works, a bad actor, um, you know, saw that the target had taken a new position as an enterprise exec or an enterprise assistant uh, at the organization and then emailed uh, utilizing contact information available on LinkedIn, emailed that target pretending to be the EA's uh, boss and asking for an urgent favor. And of course, since the EA had just started, you know, wants to make the boss happy. Absolutely. Um, ask money to be transferred, gift cards to be bought. And this whole scenario was made all that more believable by references to other people that worked in the company, um, data that had been gathered through LinkedIn, and, and unwitting employees who probably provided more information um, when contacted by them than they should have. So utilizing all of this, they put together um, kind of an operational overview of um, chain of command, organizational structure within the organization, and pretended to be somebody that they that they really weren't. So how do you counteract these threats? Um, like I said, the weak link is people. So at Pink Lion, we focus on education, education, and more education. Um, training on how these cyber scams work, it, we believe that that makes it easier to recognize um, the threats when you know how they work and when you know the types of information um, that, that folks are after. And then we follow these up with campaigns to measure how well employees are able to recognize scams. Um, and in areas where there's deficiencies or things slip through the cracks, we retrain where needed. It's definitely not a punitive approach to it at all. 
it's an education, repetition, and just, you know, having people be a little bit more suspect and suspicious, um, asking for, you know, a, a person to verbally authenticate something that they received over a text message or an email or something like that. Um, just being familiar with these types of, of you know, sec possible security breaches and incident goes a long way in being able to um, not fall victim to one. And then there is technology help available for some of these issues too. Um, we employ these at Pink Lion password managers such as 1Password, LastPass, Dashlane. These are multi-platform. They work on Android phones, iOS phones, um, you know, Macs, PCs, all of it. Um, they allow you to effectively manage different passwords for um, every site that you utilize. And we recommend that you use a different password for every site. Um, it's almost a certainty these days that sites or services that are online will be compromised. And when that happens, uh, you don't want your other accounts to be at risk. It's better to just have you know, one incident and you've got an account that's tied to that site. You can go in and change that password and not be at risk of you know, somebody utilizing those same credentials to get into your bank or you know, things of that nature. And then the other technology um, mitigation factor that I'd highly recommend, two-factor authentication, anywhere that you're able to use that. Um, focus on utilizing application-based um, authenticators. Again, these are multi-platform. They work on all of your phones, all of your devices. Authy, 1Password has got this built in, and then Google Authenticator too. And in the event that you're using a service that doesn't support uh, application-based two-factor as a fallback SMS or text message-based, uh, Two-factor is, is a good um, thing to utilize. A little bit more vulnerable than the application-based approach, ironically, but still, um, it, it, it's good to have on there if you've got um, no other options. So with that said, hopefully this kind of gave you some insight as to the threats that we face, you know, in enterprise today and what we're, uh, you know, as a technology company doing to counteract these. Um, and with that, I'll pass things over to Devar. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so just to pause for a moment and share how um, it, important it is for all of us from interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary background to P, be here uh, building our power and AI together. So AP is at the front lines uh, in her work on bioinformatics, looking at you know, clinical trials and bringing amazing you know, scientific uh, revolutions really to the healthcare industry uh, through her work and the testing that she does with her teams. Uh, Chris, uh, you just saw the, the uh, element of learning and being able to, uh, through education, teach people about you know, the bad actors and ways to keep safe and ways to promote artificial intelligence in ways that it's going to be productive. And of course, with Nishan having um, real experience as a police officer to be then able to step back and say, okay, how am I going to inform this future of artificial intelligence uh, through uh, cybersecurity consulting? We need to all be in this game together for the future of AI to be uh, relevant to all of us. And so I'm transitioning now to something that has been brought up a few times, and that is the importance of needing uh, more and diverse data sets in order for the AI future not to be uh, really biased and to be able to include a lot more of us. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, so my company is called IVAO AI, and uh, we're representing the foremost advancement in AI as it applies to audience and heritage research. So um, culture IQ is uh, really think about sentiment analysis, which Chris brought up. Well, think about cultural intelligence being another new tool for brands and governments to be able to engage more authentically uh, with consumers and the public. But of course, uh, without all of us being in this game together, we, have, we can't make it ethical and we can't make it secure. So uh, important as we bring up new foundations for building a more beneficial artificial intelligence to think of all the other um, pieces that are gonna make it powerful. Next slide, please. So uh, the concept is really that conversational AIs like Alexa and Siri are gonna be ubiquitous as part of our civic life and commerce. And so how can we teach machines about our culture, our heritage to build more uh, smarter technology? Uh, next slide. So the problem is that, uh, you know, when it comes to brands, 91% of brands believe that consumers want 
higher personalized experiences. And also, uh, they agree that consumers are likely to spend more money with brands that they feel connected to. In addition, 52% of brands agree that small data is better than big data to help them understand consumers' actions, but the statistics all show, if you come up with the next slide, that brands don't think that they actually have this information. They don't have small data. There's a ton of big data, but there's not enough concentrated small data for brands to, or even governments to be able to reach people in direct ways that are going to be relevant to them. Next slide. So our AI platform uses machine learning to catalog cultures and automatically segment consumer audiences based on contemporary culture and subculture factors. These are all um, open source. What I mean by that is that we are not taking in private information. The um, machine learning tools that we use and the cultural intelligence that we're gathering is all based on uh, open URLs. Uh, the idea is to yeah, exactly, identify, analyze, and catalog cultural segments using public data and culturally train consumer-facing messaging AI platforms like Alexa and Siri, and um, also provide uh, cultural analytics to inform marketing decision-making. Simultaneous with this, this is an example of how it would work. Let's say you're on a hotel website and you're trying to book a quinceanera for your daughter and that's a uh, Latina coming of age, uh, Latinx coming of age celebration. Um, as soon as you put in the word quinceanera, uh, the chatbot that is engaging with you is obviously not necessarily going to know what that means, but through our APIs and cultural IQ, it will be able to give you options to respond, in which case um, the response in this case would be, we do have a ballroom big enough for your father-daughter dance. And so the customer responds, my daughter turns 15 in April and we'd like to hold her consignera on the weekend. So you can see how inserting cultural intelligence in automation, especially in the area of conversational AI, is going to maximize conversions by allowing training chatbots to be more responsive uh, to the re, uh, and sensitive culture information that's coming in. So if you go to the next slide, we cannot be a cultural intelligence uh, startup without also uh, getting new data sets because the current data sets are lacking in terms of information. So we are currently seeking support to crowdsource diverse computational data sets because AI-driven technologies, as we've discussed uh, on this webinar, actually entrench social divides by inadvertently promoting biased human decisions. And so if we want to uh, help machines not be as biased, we have to feed them better data. And this is a process that is gonna take 10 years. This is not a process that there's a quick fix. So as AP mentioned uh, in one of her first slides, when you want to identify the number one, there's so many different pieces of data that you have to go through to be able to identify, you know, which is the closest target. But if you don't have enough data to sort through, you know, you're not going to be able to uh, be more relevant, especially when it comes to building uh, products and solutions um, like Fitbits, you know, that will be more culturally relevant to women, etc. And next slide. So um, the first data set that we're tackling is an algorithm for stories on women. Uh, the women, uh, the winning algorithm will be able to generate a character profile when the name of a prominent uh, female in history is inputted and also include an informative caption, caption fewer than 100 words. The idea here is for the winning algorithm to be reproducible and to be open sourced on AI comments. Um, I want to just pause here a little bit and talk about AI comments and you know this effort. Uh, first, to thank AP for being one of the minds behind this entire thing. Uh, AP, myself, and Kashyap Morali uh, started looking into creating new data sets on women uh, maybe six months ago. And uh, where we're at right now is we're in a crowdfunding um, stage but we will be talking about this in Geneva at the AI for Good Summit um, in May 
and we'll actually be doing some demos. So shout out to AP. Shout out to Pink Lion for being a founding friend of this data set challenge. It is important that all of us from different backgrounds come together to make this possible. And Jennifer, the CEO of Pink Lion, has been a huge advocate of pushing this, and we're incredibly grateful. Uh, shout out to Nishan, who is at the forefront of leading some of the work around AI Commons and who uh, was recently in Geneva at a big round table and uh, will be promoting uh, this particular data set challenge in the coming months. And uh, shout out to Anna Roisman uh, for being a champion of this and allowing me to join your uh, webinars to be able to talk about pausing and thinking about beneficial AI. So last slide. Um, how you can help us is to join us by being an ambassador uh, help us to find sponsors we're trying to raise 150k by july 2020 uh, to support the computing editorial and prize money as i said we're going to be presenting this at the ai for good summit in may 2020. Uh, in may 2020 i'm also chair of uh, the cultural heritage um, session in uh, geneva where we're doing a session on indigenous knowledge and AI. And uh, on the panel will be a uh, software engineer from Microsoft who is from the Cherokee Nation, a uh, AI researcher from Florida International University who is from the Crow Native American tribe, and a conversational AI writer from the Navajo Reservation. Uh, the point here, again, how can we think about the knowledge that exists, the wisdom that has made us who we are, and be able to bring these in the form of computational data sets to artificial intelligence. Thank you. So we're going to go next to Q&A, so feel free to put in your questions uh, here. And Anna, did you want to add anything while we wait for questions? Uh, uh, I No, I think you covered everything. I think everybody who um, joined us today and uh, in Test Masters Academy, we want to continue the education in software testing on this new venture, which is artificial intelligence. And thank you, Projecta, and everybody who joined us today on uh, starting educating our community, because I feel that our community needs to know more about artificial intelligence, because we need to be at the table when decisions are starting to be made on uh, implementation of artificial intelligence in our daily life. And with that, I'm gonna go to questions though. Thank you very much. Great. I had a question for AP and Chris. So you are uh, leaders in the testing QA world. What are the common questions that testers ask you about the future of AI and testing in particular, AP? Uh, the most common question that I've gotten from testers is, is it going to take up my job? Um, and will AI replace all the testers and we're not going to have a job anymore? That's, I think, the most common question I've heard. Um, and the answer to that, I think, is no. Because right now, as I said, like AI has, you, you need to see AI as a supportive system to help you test better or to help your organizations in different ways um, for things that are very difficult um, for us to do every single day, right? Like Chris and uh, Nishan touched upon some of the examples from cybersecurity. There's so many other examples. And so it should be a partner for you more than a competitor. Um, and the sooner you start to learn about it, and understand it, you're gonna feel less and less uncomfortable about AI and AI algorithms and all of the above. There's like no Terminator out there. This is really something that can help you advance in your testing field and in your career as you move forward. Great, Chris, do you wanna go next and then we'll check the question here from Portia. Yeah, I mean, in that question, AP, that's exactly um, the number one thing that we hear too, is, is it going to take my job? And we're, we're in alignment on that. Absolutely not. Um, you know, that we're turning automation and, and AI kind of towards the things that should be automated. Um, 
navigating to pages, tech, checking to make sure that visual elements are there, those sorts of things. Um, not to mention the training that goes into training the AI bots. That's a continuous, um, you know, that, that never seems to end. There's always something new to train them on. There's always relearning that's going on. It takes people to do those things. So no, it, it, jobs are not going to be, you know, taken anywhere near in the near term. It's great. Um, so the question from uh, Portia is, would love to hear any of the panelists' thoughts on AI in hiring and recruitment and opportunities to mitigate bias in future and existing tools used in the industry. Um, so feel free to let us who wants to take that. I'm, I'm going to share a link uh, in there, Portia, uh, in the next few minutes for you. Um, there is a tool that um, you can use when you are writing job descriptions, uh, which will actually use AI to give you hints on some words that you're using that might be, uh, you know, not necessarily offensive to women, but uh, not be as encouraging for women to apply. So for example, I didn't know this, but according to this tool, the word tackling is more of a masculine word. So I don't know. I'm just saying this is the interesting things that come out of this, like uh, similar to what Nishan was saying earlier about, you know, how Google translates. But does anyone want to answer Portia's question? Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I think Portia, it, it's, it's very much, um, it's a double-edged sword, right? So, so of course, on, on one hand, you kind of think, well, in, in the ideal world, you have an AI algorithm that's uh, utilized in uh, recruitment. And the concept being that because it's an AI and it's a logical process, that therefore you're going to root out all of the biases, all of the discrimination, whatever else, and it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be this ideological, uh, meritoc meritoc mer meritocratic uh, um, system that just bases it purely based on, oh, you've got these qualifications and therefore, you know, thumbs up, you get the job or not. Um, as we've kind of brushed upon today, um, that probably isn't the case. And I think it really comes down to um, the actual algorithms that are being used, the data sets that are being used, and the solutions that are being used. I'm sure there are some companies that, again, utilize the AI as part of the paper sift, for example. Uh, and that, and then that, but again, that funnels through to a human that can actually look through. And that's assuming, of course, that the human is actually, you know, free of any kind of bias or discriminators, right? Um, but then, of course, I think a lot of companies perhaps utilize an AI solution, which does, isn't actually overly encompassing. And as you say, it, it, use, it uses, uh, uh, I guess, training from certain things that actually don't equate very well to an actual filtering process. So as Devar mentioned, certain keywords there that based on some algorithmic process, somewhat something that AP might write uh, as a job application, it says, oh, you know, the probability is that she's going to be a, a complacent employee and not someone that's good to hire compared to if someone else uses, says the same thing with the same qualifications, but just uses different words, it might be that, ah, oh, this person is going to be very good for our organization. And there are tools, of course, now, strangely enough, that you're kind of battling the algorithm and how, how best to frame your, your, um, your application based on that. So I think it's, I think it is a very good tool. Uh, and I think the, 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 Potential is definitely there, but at the moment it's still a work in progress and that ties into everything that we've been saying right now that AI isn't the one-stop solution and it's very much at stage one and people are using it as if, it, you know, like a, an end stage kind of thing. Um, and we've got this disparate, disparity, disparity between the two, disparity yeah. between the two. Um, that's true. And I just shared that text, um, it's called textio.com. So that's a tool where you could drop in a job description and it'll give you a sense of the, the, the gender balancedness of it. So look at that. Um, you can also look it up because it's been written up uh, in news articles about you know, how effective it is. Um, there's another question. Uh, when you talk about training the AI, how do you go about doing this? Can you give an example? Um, Chris? Well, yeah, I, I can speak to that. It depends on what, uh, you know, AI you're training. In our particular case, um, when I say training the AI, so um, our bots are going out and crawling either web pages or mobile applications. Um, and they've got a neural net that is seeing hundreds of thousands of mobile applications and web pages. So they recognize 
to a large degree out of the box elements like uh, a, a submit button, for example, or a, a text label or a text entry field, a name field, an address field. Um, you know, that said, though those neural nets have been well trained, um, there's always particular nuances. Say, for example, we're testing Dell's websites. They may utilize some images or some, um, you know, elements uh, on the pages that haven't been seen um, before by the neural net. So we've got what's called a labeler. All of the elements that are discovered on these pages come back and somebody actually trains the bots on this is an okay button or this is a um, add to cart button, those sorts of things. Um, and from that, then once you've labeled those, the bots get better at recognizing those elements when they move. As I said before, um, our application doesn't look at the DOM or the code layer behind it. So um, it recognizes these elements when they change locations or even pages that they're on. Once those elements have been labeled by somebody manually, then the bot uh, recognizes those no matter where they may go, and you can use those elements in the creation of test cases um, is, is really how the pink lion solution works. Hopefully that gives you some insight into what I mean when I say training the bots. Yeah, and in simple terms, if I was to add, in simple terms, think about you read, you know, you looking through images, you yourself looking through a book or images that you have never seen before, right? Um, so you might recognize some things and you may not recognize the others. But as you keep looking through that book over and over or, you know, through your application as a tester, you start to learn more and more about it. But the more you do, the more better you get. So I think that's what Chris is talking about, like when the bot's on and it's looking through these um, sites, the more it sees, the better it gets at understanding whether a button is an okay button or it's just an image, um, so on and so forth. Yeah. And I guess I can uh, maybe end with an example that really wraps everything together and ties it with a bow. So uh, using the AWS image recognition app, I put in a picture of a St. Patrick's Day parade and with 98% confidence, uh, the same, this AWS uh, particular tool said that there was a kilt and a bagpipe uh, in this photo. I put in a mariachi band and this AWS image recognition was very confused. This is the point. Obviously they have fed many, many images of a St. Patrick's Day parade or kilts to the image recognition app. That's why it's our responsibility to make sure that as we go forward, we can uh, help AI become a lot more uh, culturally aware to reach all of us. There is one last question. We have just little more than three minutes left. And the question is, there are useful NLP and conversational AI tools out there that can be used to help add a voice UI to test Teams tools. Uh, and this is more of a comment. Testers should try to embrace, embrace these supportive tools that can enhance your team's processes. So uh, thank you so much. Feel free to draw, uh, put in some of the links uh, before we end this webinar. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Dawar, I wanted to go back to the first question where yes. we had, do we have biases when we do recruiting, right? Um, I only have two things in addition to what Nishan said. So one, I would encourage you to apply without thinking if there's an AI algorithm out there or not. If you're not going to apply, you're not going to hear back. <laughs> and the second thing is, if you really think that you are uh, qualified for that role, however, there might be a bias or something else, there's no harm in you reaching out to the HR or if you know the hiring manager on LinkedIn or on other social media. Uh, I get a ton of messages and uh, I'm generally very open to talking to people or even discussing with them why or why not they may not be a good fit. So those are the two tips outside of AI algorithms that might be used in industry. Amazing. I think with that, Ayana, are you going to help us wrap? Hi. Hi. Um, yes, yes. Um, thank you so much, everyone, who participated today. today. Um, please, um, please keep, keep in touch, touch with us. us. Keep in touch with our panelists. Our next webinar on this series will be in March. And uh, usually what we try to do here is to cover different uh, areas of AI interaction with the humans and how we as testers can participate in making sure that the quality of this interaction 
is still doing. Awesome. Oh, Thank you. Anna is in Egypt. That's why she's having connectivity issues. But she is letting us all know that the next webinar will be March 24th. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us.